Good evening, church. I'm still learning or remembering the seasons here. Is this normal for us to have rain in December? This is normal? Okay. All right. Well, I love it. Um, and I'm, it's great. As James was saying, nice, cool, cool weather coming in behind it. I am thankful. Maybe you are too. I'm not sure where your background is. I'm thankful that I could turn my wipers on and it, I can see clearly and I'm not having to use a shovel or having to use a broom or other things, right? So um, my wife's uh, mom, we call her Grammy. My mother-in-law just came down. She's joined us from Wisconsin and we were laughing because uh, the other morning it did freeze and I had to, I, I park outside and I had to use a scraper to get the ice off my windshield and uh, she, she was surprised. She's like, I'm surprised you had a scraper. I'm like, well, I, I actually had one still from Quebec, from language school. As we're unpacking boxes, we're finding all kinds of great things. And um, I'm already off my notes. But, but um, she, was, she was saying, you know what, we, when we left Quebec, we actually had two scrapers, and we gave one to them. They're in Wisconsin. And she, did, she said, we still use it. And I said, I remember, that's the one with the telescoping hand. And she said, yeah. When we first got to Quebec, the first big snowstorm we had, I realized I, I had a foot. It was literally 12 inches of snow on top of our car. And, and um, I realized I needed something quite a bit bigger than the little hand one that I had to be able to push all that snow off because I knew as soon as I got on that road to go to language school, I was going to dump an entire sheet of snow on the car behind me. And so I ran to a Canadian tire store and got one of the big, huge brooms, and then I gave it to my in-laws because they would have a use for it because Niger never snowed. I had no problem with that. All right, well. Let's talk about the church. We are studying, uh, we're doing a little mini-series uh, from Ephesians chapter 4. We've been looking at verses 11 to 16, and uh, tonight's actually the, the final uh, message in this little mini-series. I've been enjoying this, and I'm uh, hoping in the not-too-distant future, God will allow us to actually just dive into the book of Ephesians, and we'll just go through the whole book together. But we're going to be focusing on uh, 4.15 tonight, uh, chapter 4, verse 15. Truth in love. And if you know this verse at all, you'll see how creative I am in my titling still. Truth in love. But before we get to the verse, I'd like to review some of the context of Ephesians so that we know what we're talking about. Paul is writing, he has written a letter to the church in Ephesus. We call that the book of Ephesians. The church was actually started, if you remember this story, there was a man named Apollos who is a very gifted orator, and he is in the synagogue in Ephesus, and he is, he's getting followers because he's such a good speaker. Well, Priscilla and Aquila, if you know their, those names, they heard Apollos talk, and, and Acts 18.26 says they pulled him aside because he only knew about John the Baptist. He's preaching in the synagogue, didn't even know Jesus. So Priscilla and Aquila pull him aside, and they instruct him in the faith. And they say, hey, there's a little bit more to this story than ju just John the Baptist. You need to know the rest of what happens. And so that was the, the seeds, how the church started. And then Paul actually uh, went there, and he was there for two and a half to three years. He was their first pastor. And then after he left, Timothy pastored for about a year and a half. Now, what is so great about this, this story is... We're already seeing, we have a, a context from the book of Acts. We also obviously have the book of Ephesians, but Paul wrote to Timothy. So the letters of First and Second Timothy, they're actually letters from Paul to Timothy as he's the pastor of this church. And if you read First Timothy 1, you can see very clearly this church had some struggles that, that Timothy needed help with. And so Paul was trying to instruct him over 30 years later. You may know from the, the, remember in the beginning of the book of Revelation, there are seven letters to churches, right? Chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, it's a letter to the church in Ephesus, this church. And so we actually have a glimpse, not only from how the church started, all the way to the book of Revelation, what it looked like 30 years later. And there's some lessons to learn in that. The major themes in this book, the, the, the major theme is unity, but Paul also talks a lot about love, and he talks about truth. And we see all three of these come up in chapter 4, especially in verses 11 to 16 that we're focusing on. So, where have we been the last few weeks? Well, 11 to 16, 
when we read this, we actually need to take a very deep breath as we start and then try to exhale the whole way through because this is a paragraph in our Bible. It's one sentence. This is actually one thought, and it's a big, complicated thought that Paul is going through. And what have we said so far? Well, we said Christ gifts people to his church so that the church will grow. And in this example of verses 11 and 12, he is gifting leaders to the church. And what does he say? He gifts people to the church. He gifts these gifts to the church so that the saints may be equipped. And I, and I said that word means so that the, the, the saints are outfitted, they're repaired, they're, they're made whole, they're, they're ready for service. So they all can serve. That was very important on that first message, if you remember that, that the work of the ministry, it's meant for each of us to be participating in. We're going to see it even more tonight. So that the body is built up. And this is the goal. We're going to see this over and over again. In, in the illustration that Paul is using is a church building. Each of us are components of the church building. And it's, it's as if he's saying the construction site is constructing itself. He's saying the body, the church, is building itself up. That's what's meant to happen. And this is supposed to go on until the body attains the unity of the faith, until they reach unity of the faith. And remember, when we talked about that, the unity of the faith, that's the faith is we reach unity around the core doctrines of the gospel until we come to a knowledge of who Jesus is and the way that he wants us to live. And the body is mature and complete. Well, last week we talked about, he, he uses, uh, verse 14, he uses this illustration of being tossed back and forth, being vulnerable in this contrast. So the body is supposed to be mature and complete. It's not supposed to be vulnerable, unable to, hand wrong, unable to handle wrong teaching. And this was a very, very real issue in this church in Ephesus. If you look at 1 Timothy 1, you see it clearly. And if you look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 through 7, you see it again clearly. They struggled with teaching here, which is very interesting because from the very first seeds, what was going on? Apollos was teaching the wrong thing. And Priscilla and Aquila had to set him straight. And so it's interesting how churches get cultures. Well, that brings us to our text. So, Ephesians 4, 11 to 16, I'm not going to try to do it in one breath, but let's reread our text so we have an idea of what the word says. And he gave, him, he gave himself, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. So these are the gifts that Christ has given to the church for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's the building up of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cutting craftiness of deceitful plotting. So here's our key verses for tonight, verses 15 and 16. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Paul can pack a lot into one sentence, can't he? Wow, there's a lot here. Well, what we're going to do this evening is we're going to touch on verse 16, but then we're going to go back and we're going to focus on that first phrase in verse 15 and really wrestle with what does it mean to be speaking the truth in love. Let's pray before we do. Father, your word is truly incredible. Paul was inspired by you 2,000 years ago to write these words to a group of believers. And yet, the principles, the truths that he writes about absolutely matter for how we speak to each other this evening. Your word is alive. And we will be held accountable for how we respond to it. Whether we understand it, whether we obey it, You've given it to us, and, and, and so, Father, I thank you 
And I ask you to help us. The gravity of even this moment of us understanding more and then being held accountable to a higher standard because we've heard your word again. Father, the gravity is weighing on me, and I ask that you help us. Help us to not just understand, and we do ask for that. We ask that you help us to understand, but Father, please help us to obey. Help us to take a step closer to you in our walk with you tonight as we seek to obey you and please you. And Father, please, as as we attempt to, to please you and honor you, please, please help us. We need your strength and your help. And it's in your precious son's name we come to you. Amen. Well, what is he saying here in verses 15 and 16? There are several phrases that, that are key. One is, he says, may grow up. If, if you look at verse 15, he says, speaking the truth in love may grow up. This is still it, it, carrying on this thought that he has been saying in verse 12, building up, and in verse 13, attaining the unity and the knowledge, the body becoming mature and complete. He's still talking about this maturing process. I don't know if you've had teenagers in your house recently, but you know as, as kids hit those years of 10, 11, 12, 13, our bodies, and I don't know why this is, but our bodies don't stay proportionate during those years. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's usually the feet that grow first, right? Right? So you get these, these extraordinarily long feet, and sometimes the arms too. And whatever it is, the body is disproportionate for a little while. And it's unfortunate because they actually run into stuff, right? They run into chairs and tables and, the, and walls. And you go, what just happened? But it's because they're disproportionate. That's not the image that, that Paul wants for our church. Christ is the head, and he wants us to be growing up in proportion with him who is already mature. But the reality is, we can get out of proportion, can't we? Because some are growing and some are not. It can be an issue. Let's be honest about it. The goal is for us to grow up into him. Now, this is great. Grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. And then he says, from whom? And then these next few words that he says after this, he's referring back to this whom, this Christ. And what he says, he says, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. This is so crucial for us to understand. He's saying Christ is the head, but he's also the supply. If you think about it this way, have you ever built a bridge um, out of little wooden sticks, whether they're toothpicks or those little wooden tongue depressors. Have you ever had that project in engineering school? We had one one time where they gave us a sheet of paper. This is first year engineering in college. They gave us a sheet of paper and they gave us a little stick of glue. Each team had the same supplies and they said, you've got to build a structure. It has to be three inches tall and it can only be one inch wide, but we're going to put a crushing machine on it. You've got this amount of glue and you have one sheet of paper. You can fold it, you can cut it, you can do what you want, but it has to be three inches tall, it has to be one inch in diameter. Whoever can build the structure Strongest structure in one hour, you win. That was fun. That, that's a great class, all right? You get to pay thousands of dollars for it. But that, how you build those little sticks, and you can put those sticks together, but the glue matters. And when we were folding that paper, it really mattered where we put the glue, right? The glue is holding it together. You may think of it in terms of machinery. Christ is the grease that just keeps the gears of the church working together. You may think of it in, in terms of a plant. Christ is the nutrients that flows through that plant so the entire plant is healthy and strong. What Paul is saying is, from whom? From Christ. Christ is the one that is, is knitting. He's joining the body together. He's knitting it together so that, those, that everything is supplied well. It's a beautiful picture. And one commentator said, and I think that this is really important for us to understand. One commentator said, our health as a church is absolutely dependent on our connection to that vital supply of Christ. If we are not connected to him as that source, we're in trouble. I mean, you think about the analogy of a plant. You remove a leaf, it could be a beautiful leaf when you remove it. If it's no longer attached to that plant, what's going on, right? And so this is part of that covenant that we make, that we connect together. We need each other, and Christ is that supply. 
that's knitting us and joining us together. What a cool picture. Well, then he goes on later and he says, according to the effective working by which every part does its share. Now, what does that mean? Let let me say it as plainly as I can. If you're a member of Faith Baptist Church and you are not serving, then our church is weaker because of it. I would even call it an injury. Every part has a, a share in the work of the ministry. Every part is meant to be functioning together. And so, and you've been given gifts that are meant to contribute to this body of Christ. And so if you are not attached to the body well, and if you are not contributing to the body, we're hurting because of it. That's tough, isn't it? But it's going to mean that parts of us are more immature than others. We're not growing up well together. We are meant to work together to help each other grow. Christ is the supply, but every part has a share in the work. That means we need each other. We need the gifts that you have. And then that final picture again, edifying itself, building itself up in love. It's a great, great image. So what is the point that Paul is making? He's saying that Christ is the lead. He's the head. He is the chief shepherd. I am an under shepherd. I am a shepherd. I'm, I am, and, and you are sheep. That's not meant to be derogatory. That's the image that God gives us. I am responsible to care for you and to lead you well. And I pray And I'm asking God to help me do that. But he's the chief shepherd. I'm the under shepherd under him. He is the lead. He's the head. He's also the supplier. And we need that supply, don't we? Every part has work to do. Every part has work to do. And and church, again, let's just call it what it is. When we don't do this well, We have problems in our church. Our church is weaker for it. And then people rightly say, wow, they're not, that's not a very strong church. Or I don't, they're, they're discouraged about the church. And rightfully so, because we're not being the healthy body that we need to be. Every part has work to do. And then finally, the goal is maturity in Christ. All through this, Paul is saying we need to be maturing into the body that we are supposed to be. That's unity found in Christ. Okay, so how do we do this? How do we grow? What The, the key that I want to focus on this evening is this. How do we actually get there? Now, the Bible has a number of different ways that we are to grow. But Paul focuses on one, and that's what I want to focus on this evening. He uses this phrase, truthing in love. So this is, this is a great of Paul. It, um, and I didn't realize this until I was studying this uh, for, for this message. In our Bibles, I think if I asked, if we have 10 different versions in here, every version that I looked up uses the phrase, speaking the truth in love. Okay, as far as I I couldn't find a version in English that, that did it differently than that. What's very interesting in this is this. If you look this up in Greek, there's no word speaking. What Paul did was he actually took the word truth, and he turned it into a verb. And so Paul actually says, truthing in love. This is how we're supposed to grow, truthing in love. And it's very difficult to translate. The the idea, and I think the translation of speaking the truth in, in love is the best way of trying to put that into English. What he's saying is we need to be living out the the truth in love. And, and the best way of doing that is to speak it is to be telling each other the truth in love. That's how we grow. And I would even add to that, we, we are now, and I, and I think you'll understand this, we need to be telling the, speaking the truth to, in love to others. We also need to be speaking the truth in love to ourselves. You probably talk to yourself more than you talk to anyone else, and you also probably hear yourself more than you hear anyone else. And if you're telling yourself lies... You are not helping yourself grow. Do you understand what I'm saying? We need to be speaking the truth in love. And the immediate application is to others. And that's a correct application. But we've got to be speaking the truth to ourselves as well. We can beat ourselves up over things that are not our fault. And we can also excuse things that we need to confess. So it goes both ways. 
but truthing in love. Okay, so as we dive into this, love, I think we get that. The love part is, is the word that we know. It's, it's the word agape. It's the word of Christ sacrificial love. We've seen Christ's example on the cross. Christ has told us we should be willing to lay our lives down. It's a sacrificial love for other people. We get that. The problem is with the truth part. We are struggling with what truth is today. So what is truth? I, uh, I had the opportunity to uh, teach a little uh, Bible study to a group of kindergarten to second graders. And that was fun. We had the topic of truth. So I decided, okay, well, let's go ahead and ask the question. So I asked a group of uh, kindergarten to second graders, what is truth? How would you explain truth to a younger brother or sister at home? Do you know what their definition of truth was? It, it was I loved it. It was brilliant. I can't do better. A- any guesses as to how they defined truth? Okay, good. Don't lie to obey. Those are all good. Here, here's what they said. It's what really happened. That's brilliant. That's true. Exactly right. So you think about it. Did, were you not paying attention and you spilled the cup? Yeah, that's what really happened. Did mom say, do not have the cookie before you finish your homework? And you have the cookie before you finish the homework? Yeah, that's what really happened. That's what truth is. It's what really happened. What's amazing is we struggle with that. We forget that. And we we come up with all kinds of great excuses why we should say other things. A little bit more formal definition is that which corresponds to reality. But even with that definition, we need a little bit more explanation. And here's the reason why. Very few of us actually have a firm grip on reality. Now, I'm saying this lovingly. I'll, I'll give you an example. This, this has been painfully, become painfully aware even in my life in the past few weeks. We're going through lots of pictures. Have you had this experience where you're thinking about a family event that happened years ago and you pull out a picture? There's someone in that picture you did not know was at that event? Do you know what I'm talking about? You're like, I had, I, if someone... 20 seconds ago had asked me to describe that event, I would have been able to talk about it for five minutes, never mentioned that person's name. And yet I have this photo, they're sitting at the table. Our memories are not infallible. We think we have a firm grip on reality. We can't even remember stuff that we did, right? And so I like a better definition, that which corresponds to God's reality, The way that God defines reality, that's reality. Are you with me? And so that is important when we're talking about truth. What God says is true, that's what is true. That's what really happened. That's the way the world works. I don't get to redefine it. Even if I don't remember that person at that event, they were really there. I don't get to rewrite it. It's what really happened. It is not what I wished had happened. That's a, far more, that's a far easier version of the truth. That's what we tend to do, to, isn't it? Well, let's, if I soften it a little bit, then maybe the punishment won't be quite as bad. It's not what I think you want to hear. How many times have you had that conversation with a young person? Do not tell me what you think I want to hear. Tell me what happened. Do you think God says that to us? Can we just be honest in our prayers with him and confess for what what really happened? It's also not what I want you to believe. We are, and, and the reason I put this up is this. We live in a world right now where someone says, this is the goal and I believe this is good. So it doesn't really matter what I say right here to get you from here to here. As long as you get here, it's okay because I've decided that is good. That's a major problem. That is not the truth. And and what that is, is that's the end justifying the means of getting someone there. We don't get to make up stuff right here just because we think they need to get here. And we can be guilty of it, especially if we think this is really good. It's not what I want you to believe. We need to speak the truth. So what does this look like? What I'd like to do, 
I'd like to try something. We haven't done this here yet. If you'll be brave, I'd love to have a few people read a few verses. Okay, so is someone willing to look up Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1, and read it aloud in just a moment? Proverbs 15, 1. Someone take that verse. We're going to have five or six of these. Okay, uh, my trend, Proverbs 15, 1. Is someone willing to take Proverbs 25, 15? Proverbs 25, 15. Okay, Proverbs 25, 15. Proverbs 16, 21. Who will take Proverbs 16, 21? You got it? Good. Um, what about Proverbs 17, 14? Good, over here. Um, Proverbs 12, 18. Proverbs 12, 18. Okay, excellent. Uh, Proverbs 27, 14. Maybe one of my favorite Proverbs of all time. Proverbs 27, 14. This is going to be a fun one. Who will take that one? Good, okay. And then final one, Galatians 6, 1. Galatians 6, 1. Who has that? Thank you. Okay, so what is truth? It's what really happened. And Paul is saying we need to speak the truth in love. So I want to get very practical for the next few minutes. Let's talk about what does this actually look like? How do we actually do this? Proverbs, you can tell we're, we're going to spend a lot of time in Proverbs, but it's not just that. I'm going to give you some other references. There's some very practical ways that we can do this, okay? The first is this. These are biblical principles for truthing in love, okay? Uh, Proverbs 15.1. Uh, well, whoever has that, read that out nice and loudly. Okay, a soft answer. If we're having truthing in love conversations, we need to approach them gently. That's the manner in which we're talking with somebody. And what this means is, if we know we have a tough truth that needs to be shared with someone, it's okay, even in our speech, but in our posture to go into it with the idea, I need to be gentle in how I handle this. Okay, let's take the next one. What about Proverbs 25, 15? By long forbearing is a prince persuaded and a soft tongue breaketh the bones. By long forbearing, a prince is persuaded. What does that mean? It means we need to be patient. I'll give you a specific example on this. There have been times in my life I've really messed up. And someone has rightfully come alongside me with a truth in love conversation. And they've given me the list of all the things that I've done wrong. Church, there's times that we need, we need to hear the truth. But it needs to be in bite-sized chunks. It, there needs to be an amount that the person can chew on. If we're going to be truthful in love, I think that in love part, we need to be patient. Give, if, if there's someone that's perhaps they're living in your house, they're a family member, there's someone that you work with, and you need to have a tough conversation, and there's actually several things that they need to work on, just give them one at a time. Be patient and allow them to work on that and then give them the next step. Does that make sense? Give them bite-sized amounts that they can chew on and that they can grow in, but be patient because others have been patient with you. God is patient with us. We need to be patient when we're trying to give the truth in love. How about Proverbs 16, 21? The wise in heart shall be called prudent, and the sweetness of the lips increases learning. What about verse 24? Can you read that one too? That's good. That's, I want a 21, but it's also 24. It's okay, even if it needs to be a tough conversation, to be sweet. We can be kind. We don't have to be harsh. And there are ways of saying things harshly, and there are ways of saying things sweetly. A lot of that has to do with our tone. It has to do with our body posture. It can even have the atmosphere that we have set up to have that conversation. We're going to get to that in just a moment. But we can be sweet. There's part of this, and, and we're going to, I'm going to bring this around in just a moment together. But we need to be people that are fully committed to speaking the truth to each other and to ourselves. But it's okay to be gentle and patient and sweet. Proverbs teaches us all of these. Well, what about Proverbs 17, 14? Who 
If we need to have a tough conversation of speaking the truth in love and it's turning into an argument, just stop it there. Back off, take time to pray, agree to regroup, and have the conversation again at a later time in a different setting. Maybe with somebody else but involved, but stop arguing. If we've entered into arguing, we're not helping anymore. It's not a truth in love conversation. What about Proverbs 12, 18? Some of you are very good with words. And, and there are conversations that you can have. You can cut someone like a sword. We can get in conversations with people, beginning those conversations with great intent. And then the conversation starts to go sideways and we get frustrated. And that sword comes out and we can just cut them down. And Proverbs is saying, do not avoid those hasty words. If we want a truth in love conversation and we start to feel that, I don't know if you know what I mean, you can start to feel your, your body just starting to get tense or you start to, your, your, the hair in your back starts to you know, crawl a little bit and you're kind of, well, I want to say this. If you know what I mean in this, if you have a moment in a conversation where you just feel like, well, they really hurt me and I want them to know how much they hurt me, a hasty word is coming out, it's time to stop. That is no longer going to be a truth and love conversation. Okay? Now, my favorite proverb, 2714. Who has that? He who blesses his friends with a loud voice rising early in the morning, it will be counted a curse to him. I don't know if you, if you heard her. He who blesses his, his is it neighbor, friend. friend, loudly in the morning, it will be counted as a curse to him. Folks, the timing of our conversations matter. Very early in premarital counseling, uh, we were told, do not try to solve issues when there's two circumstances in particular. If you're hungry or if you're tired. If those two things are already going on, the deck is stacked against you, that is not the time to have a tough conversation. And you know what we found in our marriage? That was good advice. When we are hungry... Okay, let's just, when I'm hungry, or I'm tired, let's say it like it is. We're being honest tonight, right? The conversation doesn't go well. Timing matters. And so if you need to have a truth and love conversation, have good timing. Make sure they've had a Snickers. Maybe even a Mountain Dew as well. Okay, have a nice meal, nice setting, approach it, be gentle, be patient, be sweet. Seek to avoid arguing, seek to avoid hasty words. The goal is restoration. Galatians 6.1. We, the goal of these truth in love conversations is healing, it's restoration, it's maturity in the body of Christ, it's unity of our body. So we shouldn't be arguing or using hasty words. It's to be love right? That's our goal. And I have, I'm sorry, I've completely run out of time. So let me give you this quote. The, the antidote to immaturity is speaking the truth in love. We've been talking about how do we grow? How do we stop being immature? We've got to speak the truth to each other. Okay. If you're walking around with broccoli in your teeth and you don't have a mask on, you want your friend to tell you the truth in love. Okay. Hey, go look in a mirror, find a toothbrush, right? John Stott said this, truth becomes hard if not softened by love. Love becomes soft if it is not strengthened by the truth. And the apostle calls us to hold the two together. One of the reasons that I wanted to give us, give us the context again of, of the book of Ephesians is this. When Ephesians, 30 years later, if you think about the, the church of Ephesians, the, the church of Ephesus, could they not have had two better pastors? They started with the Apostle Paul for crying out loud. I don't know if he was a great pastor, but I'm thinking he has a pretty good resume. And then they got Timothy. This church gets to the book of Revelation, and John has to tell them, you've lost your first love. Now, he does say, you maintain the truth. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. You, you chastise the false teachers. They did great on the truth side. They lost the love side. Church, we could be guilty of the same thing. We need both. We need the truth 
and we need the love. But the great news is we can do this because we have the truth and Christ died on the cross for our sins. He gave us the example of love. And if we're a believer, the Holy Spirit lives inside us and we have the unity of the body. We have the example. We have the indwelling of the Spirit for the love. We can do this. But we've got to grow. We've got to work on it. All right? So I wanted to give you three quick ideas and we're just going to close with this. I know that it's culturally appropriate for us to say, hey, how's it going? It's going great. Awesome. Catch you next week. That's a great American conversation, Floridian conversation, right? If we're going to speak the truth in love, we've got to be able to take the time to get past that. We've got to slow down and ask real questions. How are you really doing? Have you spent time in God's word? How's it going? And then ask, and then, and then wait for the answer. Look in their eyes. If we're going to have truth and love conversations, we need to be seeking the best of the other person. We need to have their spiritual growth, their spiritual health in mind, not just airing our grievances with how immature they are as a believer. We, we need to be seeking, going into it saying, how can I present the truth in a way that's going to help them grow? And we personally need to grow in our vulnerability. When someone asks us how we're really doing, we need to be willing to really share so that they can, we can invite the truth into our own lives, right? If we don't tell people how we're doing, if we're not vulnerable, then how are they going to speak the truth to us? They're going to have to be really brave. But if we'll be vulnerable, if we'll be open and invite those truthful conversations, then that's going to give us the opportunity to grow even more. All of us need to grow. So if we'll be vulnerable, we can facilitate those conversations. Being gentle, being patient, being sweet, right? Can we do it, church? I know we can. I know we can. Now, I've been told good preaching leaves you hungry. It gives you some truth and says, man, I need to know more. Well, I hope you've looked at these verses and said, there's a lot in there that we actually didn't get to, and you're right. So I want to encourage you, dive in. There's a lot more here. Keep studying, keep eating, keep keep chewing on the truth of God's word, and we'll grow as a church family. Let me pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word, and I thank you for the encouragement of Paul, but I also thank you for the challenge. Please help us to be a church that does not lose our first love for you or for each other, but help us to be a church that's committed to the truth, to your truth, and to be speaking it in love to each other, to be living it, living that love to each other and with each other. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the work that you've already done in us and among us. And thank you for your patience with us. In your son's name we come to you. Amen.